I was just going to say to Susanna, you so you're not seeing too many too many visitors these days. It's got to be hard. Nobody. Also, I think that um, maybe in the U.S. is uh, different, but here rules are very strict in the sense yes. that now we cannot move from um, the city where I live to uh, another town which is uh, 20 minutes away oh my goodness. from my home. So my... we are like um, prisoners. Oh, I'm sorry. Things are relaxing here in Colorado, which is almost too early. The restaurants mm -hmm. are 50% open. Um, I've got people, I work in a little store, people coming from Louisiana, Virginia, California, oh. traveling. I don't like it. Wow. No. Hmm. So, so they, they, they can cross the borders. Here is not hmm. possible. No. For instance, I am um, now working at um, courts on Dante the poet, because this year we are celebrating the seventh centenary wow. from death. And so uh, in my idea, I want to make a, a kind of mix some uh, and some guided tours, not too far away from where I live, one in Florence, one in um, Casentino, which is a, a, a region next to where I live. Hello. Hi, Kelly. But, Hi, Kelly. And but welcome the back. problem is <laughs> that, ciao. Kathleen, where are you from, Kathleen? Kathleen, can you hear me? Hi, yes, Hi. I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> where are you from, Kathleen? I don't. I don't have the camera. The camera on my computer is not working. That's okay. I'm using my TV. That's okay. Where do you live? Right. I'm in uh, Canton, Michigan. Michigan. Okay. And I'm a friend of Lisa McQuaid's. Oh, wonderful. She'll be, she'll be joining us shortly. She just hasn't got here yet. Okay, great. Well, so nice it's her you. and me and um, Diane Juan is the other person. We got three great. people on the call. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Oh, thank you. We've got thank Mickey you. also with us today, and Mickey is also from Michigan. <laughs> I'm in Clarkston, Michigan, and my cousin Kathy Barden is supposed to be joining us too. Hi, Tom and Lil. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, here comes Kathy. <laughs> How's things with you, Tom and Lil? Uh, we are doing very well. How about you? Very good. Nice to see you. <laughs> you guys are, uh, Tom and Lil actually live in Oklahoma. Yes, Tulsa. Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> you know that in the city where I live here in Tuscany, there is the University of Oklahoma. Oh. <laughs> Not now, I mean, uh, they have a beautiful place. Uh, it was a former monastery. They, they I invested a lot of money in buying it and then in uh, restoring it. And things were going very well. Many students came for semesters to study abroad art and many other things. And now, of course, it so, is So is, is it a... Uh, uh, Part of the University of Oklahoma? See, yes, it wow. is. It is part and uh, it is a kind of um, mm -hmm. yeah. a second, like second nine, five, uh, place yeah. where the students can, go, can yeah. go for a semester study to study abroad in Europe. Right. Mm. Oops. Hey, Welcome, Michelle. Welcome, Claire. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Claire, where are you calling in from? I'm calling from uh, Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Oh, wonderful. Welcome, Claire. Thank I used you. to live in Highlands Ranch for four years. 
That's um, great. <laughs> and Janet, who's with us today, also lives in Colorado. She's up in Aurora, right? Um, Arvada. Uh, Arvada. Arvada, sorry. Arvada. <laughs> words, yeah. <laughs> like there. And I Kelly know. and Dave are calling in from Ontario, so they're from Canada. And Kathleen is also from Michigan, and Michelle is from Maine. <laughs> But formerly from Toronto. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> Do you want your audio? Your video? Mm. Yeah, I got it. That's I'm very good. true. Well, we're on the hour. So uh, I would like to welcome all of you for joining us today um, on uh, a beautiful day in some places. Some places have gotten <laughs> snow, like Texas. <laughs> And, um, so, and it's a little windy here, but it, but it's nice. What's it like in Toronto, Ontario there? Uh, we've had um, a bunch of snow this week and, and it's been very cold, but it's starting to warm up a little. Right now it's gray and sort of snowy. Okay. Well, uh, this is our second session with uh, Susanna. It's a three part uh, art and wine uh, virtual tasting that we're doing with you. And um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really happy that today we're going to be uh, presenting the regions of Veneto and the region of Friuli Venezia Giulia. And um, Friuli Venezia Giulia, of course, is very special uh, to, to myself because my husband is. Uh, Sorry, Audrey. Oh, oh, I yes. don't know. Are you hearing? There's somebody's got a radio or a TV oh, or something on. It's right. really loud. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, let's have everybody mute, please. And um, if you have any questions during our presentation, please type them in the chat. That way I can monitor that and let Susanna know. Uh, we're going to go through the presentation with Susanna. And then of course, at the very end, we can open up our mics and, um, and have a chat. And so uh, I'll just recover what I was saying earlier because there was a bit of a background noise there. So Susanna is one of my dear friends. Uh, she is an expert local guide uh, in Tuscany. So not just Florence, but other beautiful towns in Tuscany. She's a level three sommelier. She's also a published art scholar. So she has uh, published a number of books that you can actually purchase on Amazon. And so I'm very happy that she can join us. And we're doing this in a three-part series. So we've covered Tuscany and Umbria, the wines and art of Tuscany and Umbria. Today, we're going to cover the arts and wines of the beautiful region of Veneto. And of course, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, which is where my husband is from and where our family lives. Uh, which is also a very well-known wine region, not so much uh, to the um, North American traveler, but um, their wines are world-renowned, especially white wines. And so with no further ado, I would like to pass this uh, presentation over to Susanna, and uh, it's all yours. <laughs> hey, welcome everybody. Uh, so. I am Susanna and um, I live in Tuscany. I am 100% uh, Tuscan since uh, the time of the Etruscans. It's true. <laughs> there is not a single drop of uh, foreign blood in my, in my family. Foreign not means, uh, doesn't mean uh, um, from uh, another country, it means from another region of Italy. So I'm truly Tuscan. But of course, uh, um, today we will uh, talk about how beautiful is Italy for its variety in every field, not only in the wine field, in the cuisine, in art, in everything also. We speak uh, differently. Uh, Tuscany speak less dialect than uh, other regions, while in other regions, especially in the south, they speak with uh, a very strong accent and sometimes with a dialect, which is uh, more similar to another language than, uh, rather than to a dialect. So, Today, uh, we will talk about uh, the North in Italy. And so I will start my presentation, which is, uh, mm -hmm. let me check. 
I think is this one dal inizio. So, okay. Sorry. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Good. Oh, you can see that um, Italy for its um, form, it's uh, like uh, a boot. And uh, this is the reason why being uh, so long, so elongated and surrounded by the seas, the ocean, um, it has uh, so many different microclimates. And this is explains why also, Italy is one of the richest countries in the world uh, in terms of uh, biodiversity. And uh, today we are talking about uh, two specific regions, uh, which are Veneto, which is the region of Venice, and uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia. You can see them uh, on the northern eastern part of this map, but we will talk more in detail about the two regions here. So you can see Veneto and Friuli Venezia Giulia. Actually, uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia is at the border with Pesha. Uh, um, and uh, Trentino Alto Adige is also at the border with Austria. So actually we are very close to the mountains, to the Dolomites and the climate is completely different from, uh, for instance, Tuscany, central Italy, which has a, a more Mediterranean kind of climate. So these two regions are in the northeastern part of Italy. And uh, there are many beautiful towns and uh, things to see in Veneto, which is one of the two regions. Veneto, of course, it's famous for Venice, but there is only Venice in Veneto. Uh, the landscape of Veneto is uh, different because uh, is, um, there are different parts, uh, an area which is closer to the mountains. And so you can see the region of Veneto is a popular tourist region. 72 scenic viewpoints, 13 lookout towers. It has a lot to offer, but it is also very interesting uh, for its morphology. And it is roughly divisible into four different areas. The Northern Alpine zone, which means very close to the mountain. The lower plain, we are very close to the big rivers of Italy, like the Po, the plain which is called the Pianura Padana, and the territory. But the 29% of its surface is mountainous, Alpi Carniche, Eastern Dolomites, and the Venetian Prealps. These mountains that you can see here in this beautiful picture are the so-called pre-alps. It means that they are not as big as the Alps and they are in between the Alps and the hills. The 57% instead is covered by a vast plain reaching onto the sea. So actually it's very nice to travel in the Veneto region because you can pass from the mountains to uh, the beach near Venice and then go 
in the beautiful hills near Verona, uh, where you can find uh, lots of famous wines, especially red wines, but we will talk a lot about it. These are instead the Alps. Uh, the chain, the mountain chains is called uh, uh, the Dolomites, and uh, you can see um, the typical landscape uh, of words, uh, um, tiny little villages built with wood and uh, a lot of uh, small lakes. And uh, uh, it's, there are very famous uh, skiing uh, towns like Cortina d'Ampezzo. And so it's a region which is a very rich in the touristic offer. Of course, uh, the most visited city of Veneto is Venice, which is uh, always beautiful in every season. You can see here a beautiful picture. It looks like a painting, but it's a picture. It's, uh, Venice as it is sometimes in the at sunset uh, in the summertime, you can see the big church with the domes, which is uh, Santa Maria della Salute. It's a, a church that was built between the 15 and the 1600s. And also the private mansions built for the rich uh, patricians, Venetian patricians, especially in the 13 and 14 and 1500s. Of course, uh, Venice is uh, famous all over the world. It's a very popular hub. And um, many people, they come for the first time to Italy and they do a kind of uh, introduction of Italy, going from Venice to uh, Florence to Rome and sometimes Naples and Sorrento, ending up uh, sometimes, very few times uh, in Sicily. This kind of trip to Italy is the classic trip. I mean, uh, it was uh, the first type of travel to Italy um, invented we can say invented by English travelers, noblemen, and it was called the Grand Tour. So um, it's incredible that still in uh, the 21st century, many people are doing the same thing because of course it's an amazing trip. It's, uh, it's uh, the classic but there is much, much more to see. And that's another good reason to start maybe your trip to Venice, but also to go a little bit off the beaten path is because Venice, like Florence, was suffering wars. Now I don't know anymore what is going on, what it will be in the next years for the over-tourism problem. And so it is, I think, in the future, very important to think about uh, sustainable travels. That means uh, uh, trying to uh, spread away from uh, the big destination, the big uh, tourist hubs like uh, Venice. Uh, Venice or Venezia is the capital of uh, the Veneto region, and it is home to many masterpieces of art and architectures. And the city itself is a gem because it's a unique world, it's built on the water, and uh, just for the light, unique in the world that you can find in Venice, uh, it's worth to go Venice at least uh, once in a life. One of the most famous places of Venice is the palace that you can see in this picture, which is the Doge's Palace. And then as I said, the Grand Canal, 
with the Dome Church of Santa Maria della Salute, the Rialto's Bridge, Piazza San Marco, San Mark Square, with the Basilica di San Marco, which is uh, the city's main attraction. This is a, a beautiful view of the gondola, the typical um, boats, black boats of Venice. And then uh, you can see the Rialto's Bridge. The Rialto's Bridge is uh, another unique bridge, like the Ponte Vecchio of Florence because uh, it is lined up by tiny little shops. And this is the thing that uh, it has in common with the Ponte Vecchio in Florence. It's easy to understand why. Now there are more bridges uh, than in the past, even though more or less uh, since uh, the 1700s, uh, no other bridge was built. No, there is a new bridge uh, in Venice that was built actually by a contemporary architect. But the reason of, of all these shops by bridges is because uh, there, was, there were very few places to cross a river or the Grand Canal. So, the merchants, we are very smart, decided to open the shops where for sure they will find people in the city. And that's why bridges like Ponte Vecchio or Ponte di Rialto. Then we can see a corner of Piazza San Marco, uh, just in front of the Doge's Palace with these beautiful Gothic arches and the architectural style of um, Venice is very, very special because it's not simply Gothic. It's a uh, uh, Venetian Gothic with many influences of the Byzantine art as well as the Moorish art. This is uh, uh, explained by the position of Venice and also from the fact that uh, many centuries, for many centuries, this city has been the capital of commerce of Italy. That means uh, that was kind of hub of Europe and uh, the East. Uh, Europe and also the Middle East. This is St. Mark's Square. You know that still in Venice, there are some problems uh, of the tide, high tide. And uh, this is uh, not a bad day. Sometimes uh, the water is very, very high city and uh, can be fun. But sometimes, especially for the people of Venice, it's a, a problem, it's a kind of um, issue to have uh, to do always with this uh, problem, which uh, hopefully uh, is being solved uh, in the most recent years. <laughs> they built uh, uh, the Mose, which was uh, uh, intended to stop this problem from the Lagoon of Venice. And uh, it seems that uh, it is working pretty well, but it took a lot of time to, to start uh, to see the result of this uh, big project. And this is the Dodgers Palace inside. Uh, Venice was uh, probably one of the wealthiest cities of uh, Italy. It was a republic, so it was a city-state. At the beginning, uh, the rich families of Venice uh, were not interested in uh, hoeing lands in land. But since the 1500s, when uh, the Mediterranean 
become less and less important uh, compared to the Atlantic Ocean because of the new discoveries. The important families of Venice decided to invest money in buying land. So this is when they built wonderful villas also in Veneto, in the region of Veneto, of uh, Venice. And the Dodges were the political leaders of the Republic. They lived in this palace and you can see from the quantity of gold used for the decoration of this beautiful ceiling, which was made with uh, wood carvings, gilded wood carvings, you can see what an investment it was to, to commission and to pay for the decoration of this palace. And then you can see a canvas painted by the most famous artists from Titian to Tintoretto to Veronese, from all the most famous artists of the Venetian school. And then we have the Ponte dei Sospiri, the Bridge of the Whispers. Uh, it's a, a very romantic place to go, but actually the reason why it's called the Ponte dei Sospiri, it's because uh, it connects the Doge's Palace to the prisons of Venice, to the jail. And of course the prisoners, uh, when they were taken for the first time across the bridge to enter into the prison, of course, uh, the whispers were their whispers. And so it's a little sad to think uh, about the true reasons why, the true reason why it is called the Ponte de Sospiri. But it is uh, so nice, so elegant, and so typical of Venice. Uh, you can see that the style, architectural style of Venice, it's very delicate, uh, very ornate. Differently, for instance, from the architectural style of Florence, which is more rational, more no frills, and more uh, conceived from a mathematical and proportional point of view. This is the famous uh, event of Venice, the Mardi Gras, which takes place every year. There is a very long tradition of this important event, and it's a, a kind of a unique experience to be there for the Mardi Gras. Uh, it was uh, a week ago, no, this week, uh, three days ago. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we had on, uh... On the 13th, uh, last Saturday, yes, last Saturday, yes. we had Chiara, who's uh, one of our guides in Venice. Uh, uh -huh. Ali was with us, uh, right? Um, and uh, she walked us live through the city of Venice. It was oh, a beautiful nice. sunny day and uh, very few people, but uh, she was, they were quite, they were at least, what, about 10 or 11 people walking around with beautiful costumes. So it was, uh, so it's quite an experience. It was very nice. Yeah. Yes, it is a, a, an experience and it's magic. It's a, a, a it's a, the atmosphere. It's a, very special. Mm -hmm. It's a magic, a, magic place and magic thing. And of course, uh, the romance of Venice uh, is uh, for sure known by everybody. And this is the typical gondola with the gondoliere. And uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, a tourist thing to do, but uh, I think that uh, you will never forget uh, this experience on the gondola ride, with the gondola ride. Besides Venice in Veneto, there are many other sites, mostly towns and villages with thousands of years of history famous for their art and some also for their wines, just a few of them. 
Padova, Verona, Vicenza, Treviso, Asolo, Castelfranco Veneto, Passano del Grappa, Cortina d'Ampezzo, Belluno, Conegliano Veneto e Masea. So many. Uh, some of them are cities like Padua, Verona, Vicenza, Treviso. Some of them are towns, much smaller, but so rich for the history, for the art, for um, a kind of character that they have depending on where they are. For instance, there are towns like Asolo, which is very close to the mountains and uh, which is characterized by a very scenic position on top of uh, a very high hill. This is Padua. Padua uh, still has one of the most ancient uh, universities of Europe. It was also a place where the famous artist left his paintings in the truly important Scrovegni Chapel, because it is a small church uh, that was a private chapel of the Scrovegni family, a rich family of uh, usurers. Enrico Scrovegni was a usurer, and in order to be forgiven for his guilty job, he decided to invest, as it was requested by the church, a lot of money in building and then in uh, decorating this beautiful church and uh, he was looking for the best artist in Italy and he found Giotto. Uh, so it's a wonderful place to visit. The church behind here at the, in the background is uh, not the Scrovegni Chapel, it's too big to be a chapel. It is the famous Basilica del Santo because it is dedicated to St. Anthony of Padua. He was from Padua and his body is, uh, uh, is uh, in this church. So the tomb and the remains of uh, St. Antonio are in this church. Uh, Padua had uh, a lot of, um, still have uh, a lot of beautiful Roman remains and actually, in the Renaissance, it was a very important cultural and artistic center because of the Roman remains, because of uh, this uh, Roman classic heritage. The same for Verona. This is the city of Verona with the arena in the middle of the city. This is a, a Roman amphitheater, which is still used for opera season in the summer. So it was another extraordinary experience to go there, to listen to um, the most famous tenors or to go and see the famous operas like the Aida by Giuseppe Verdi. Uh, there is a great opera season at the arena, but it is not only that. Uh, it's a very romantic city and it's famous for the house of Romeo and Juliet, Juliet's house actually. And this is the famous balcony. Shakespeare was inspired when he visited Verona and he ended up uh, um, in uh, knowing and being informed about uh, this very romantic uh, love story between Romeo and Juliet, which happened centuries before. And of course, uh, he made them famous. This is the 
beautiful balcony of the Juliet house, the Juliet home in Verona. And we have also Vicenza, which is a, a not too far from Verona, and it is the place where uh, the architect Andrea Palladio was born. Andrea Palladio uh, was uh, among the most important architect of the 1500s, and uh, he was uh, the architect chosen by many patrician families of Venice to build their villas in the countryside. Plus, he built for his hometown, which is, Ve um, which is um, Vicenza, this beautiful building, which is a, a, a kind of a meeting place. It was intended to be the civic meeting, meeting place. And uh, you can see the Renaissance style, the beautiful arches, the um, proportions, and also um, the use of this typical stone, which comes from uh, the region of Veneto. It's not marble. It is a uh, uh, Pietra d'Istria, which comes from the northern eastern part of Italy. Then we have Treviso, uh, very fascinating city, less known than Verona and Padua and Venice, of course. But uh, as you can see, very interesting, very charming. It's another water city rich of water, rich of canals. Then we have Asolo, um, where you can see a lot of uh, Renaissance villas built for, as I said, the rich uh, people from Venice, from other cities who liked to stay in this beautiful place not too far from the Dolomites. And that's the Franco Veneto, famous for be the birthplace of uh, Giorgione. Giorgione is an important Venetian artist. And uh, uh, Castelfranco still preserves its ancient um, perimeter of uh, city walls all built with bricks. Like in Tuscany, all these small towns and sometimes also villages were independent states back in time. So it means that they had to protect the people, the inhabitants by building walls, strong walls for defense. And that's why these fortifications are so well done, so well made. And that's why also they could last for many centuries. And this is an example. Then we have uh, Bassano del Grappa. Bassano del Grappa is a truly scenic, play, scenic place. It's famous for this wooden bridge I've been there uh, about one year ago, and uh, the, the bridge was uh, under restoration. There were works in progress, so it was not possible to walk on the bridge, but it's, uh, it's unique in, uh, in Italy, such a long, well-constructed and beautiful wooden bridge. Bassano del Grappa. Grappa in Italy is a, a liquor, very strong, almost pure alcohol. And it is made with uh, the skin grapes. Um, so by distillation, no fermentation, just distillation. And uh, Bassano is famous for the production of the best grappa of Italy. 
and it's uh, very nice to visit this beautiful town because you can find one of the most uh, the oldest distilleries of grappa of Europe, of entire Europe, and it is uh, by the bridge. And you can have uh, a drop, because for me it's too strong, of, of grappa next to the bridge in this very ancient, beautiful grappa place. I don't know the name, even in Italia, I don't know the, the name of a place where you can drink just grappa. This is Cortina d'Ampezzo. This is a famous place for skiing, for VIP people, uh, especially in the 90s and in the 80s, also Olympics were held here in Cortina d'Ampezzo. And um, this Actually, year- be, uh, This year right now, the Alpine um, ski is uh, happening right now, actually the Olympics. Come? I don't understand. I guess Sorry. Right, right now the Olympics are happening in Cortina d'Ampezzo right now. Not not the Olympics, the World Championship. Uh, sorry. Uh, the ah, sorry. Ah, yes, the you. World Championship. Yes, exactly. Yeah. No, I actually uh, posted a really cool video on Facebook with you, uh, with the. Uh, yes, you know what? That uh, after many years, finally in Cortina, they got to snow. This year, a lot of snow everywhere in the Alps, in the Dolomites. And for Cortina, it was a, a true surprise because a little bit lower down compared to other places, skiing resort. So I think uh, even though this is uh, not a very fortunate year in general, because in Italy, we cannot ski, for instance. It's not possible while in Switzerland and in Austria, it is possible to go and ski. In Italy, everything is closed, so it's not possible to go. But for the championship, it's open, of course. They are doing it now. This is uh, another beautiful town, which is Belluno. Uh, as you can see, very close mountains. It's a very little known. I think uh, only some Italians have visited Belluno. Uh, for sure not many tourists because uh, um, it's uh, literally uh, literally not known. Uh, also um, from a um, point of in tourist marketing, Belluno, uh, it's uh, the first steps we can see, but it is a, a truly beautiful town. Conegliano Veneto, very special because it has uh, buildings in town as it is in Austria, painted, the facades are painted with, with frescoes. And uh, so it's a kind of mix between the Venetian, the Veneto style and the Austrian style. And then Marostica. This is another unique town, very picturesque because in mid September, every two years, there is something special. You can see the shacks. So people play shacks, but the shacks are real people. So it's a kind of event. You can see there are flag throwers before. Uh, there is a, a great participation of the town. And uh, it's uh, an amazing day uh, because you can see that it looks like um, a medieval atmosphere with the shields hanged at the Palazzo Comunale and this uh, game of checks, uh, which is held in the square right in front. Then we have uh, the villas I was talking about, built uh, for the Venetians 
uh, Venetian families of the Doges or noble families. This is the Villa Maser, Villa Barbaro in Maser, which is not too far from Treviso. And um, these villas were conceived as a, a place for the owners to rest in peace, to invite friends, to enjoy the beautiful countryside, but they were also farms. So you can see the main body of the villa is where the owners live. And this villa is still owned by the same family, the Barbaro family. And the two wings on the two sides were instead a farm. Uh, inside the villa is uh, beautifully frescoed by one of the most incredible artists of Venice, of the 1500s Venice, which is Paolo Veronese. So it's uh, something spectacular, not only outside, but also inside. And the family, as I said, still live in there, but um, in Italy, there is a rule. If you are the owner of a, a place, which can be a villa, a castle, or which is considered of public interest, you should open your villa or part of your villa, part of your castle, at least for a couple or three days a week. And of course, uh, the visitors pay a ticket, but this is the Italian cultural heritage. So even if you are the owner, you cannot simply close the doors. And this is another villa, La Rotonda. This one was designed by the new, uh, we can say um, classical uh, architect, Andrea Palladio. You can see that the inspiration comes from the ancient Greek and Roman architecture with the Ionic capitals in the column, but also these uh, very geometrical forms, a kind of cube in the middle, and then like uh, four facades of temples on the four sides. Andrea Palladio invented this new type of architecture, which uh, was very important also for the English and the American architects. If you think about uh, Thomas Jefferson House, it was inspired by Andrea Palladio. And so there is a, a, a long echo of uh, the Palladio style also in England and in the US. And uh, last year, I'm sorry, in 2019, the um, villas of Palladio, so many, over than 40 villas uh, in the province of uh, Verona, in the province of uh, Vicenza, in the province of Padua, in the province of Rovigo, they were put together. The problem is that some of them are public, some of them are still private, but all together, this system of Palladian villa became, after a long time, was declared UNESCO a cultural heritage. You know that the villas, Renaissance villas were modern villas. The concept of a modern villa was uh, born in Florence with the villas built for the Medicis in the 1400s. It was a kind of revival of the concept of uh, villa as it was for the Romans. And so in the Renaissance, 
uh, there was a revival also of, the, of this architectural um, structure and they started to, to build beautiful mansions in the countryside as it was in the Roman times. Then this concept passed also in other regions of Italy, such as Veneto and the wines of Veneto. Now, now we can start talking about wine. The Veneto wine region is Italy's production workhorse. Also, it doesn't have the same fame as Tuscan or Piedmont, it makes the 18% of Italy's wine and uh, it, is a, uh, it has a reputation for amazing wines. Uh, you can see different colors. Uh, they refer to many different types of wine. Today, we will focus only in two small regions. The purple one, which is where I have my arrow near Verona for the production of uh, Valpolicella. And then the white one, which is uh, so big uh, and the heart of this region is Valdobbiadene for the production of uh, Prosecco. Unlike other Italian wine regions, though, the Veneto region makes world-class wines across the spectrum, sparking Prosecco to rich Amarone. The diversity in the microclimates gives the wine region a unique edge. This is the typical landscape of Veneto where hills are not as high um, as they are um, near the Alps. So I'm talking about uh, um, the proximity to the Pianura Padana. But now we are going to see the vines of Verona. With the Alps at its upper frontier, the Valpolicella, which is uh, the region we are talking about now, spans about uh, 95 square miles across Western Veneto. So we are on the west of Veneto region, on the Western side of Veneto, and to the south is Vona as you can see here in the middle. The dreamy city and home to star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet. You can see that uh, the region of Valpolicella is uh, not so big. Then there are other two regions for Bardolino, Soave, but of course for the reputation, Valpolicella is uh, for of course, more known, better known, and uh, the quality of its wines uh, explain why it is better known. The terraced hills of Bat Policella uh, are typical of this landscape, and uh, it's a, a land of red wines. Uh, so in Valpolicella, you don't find uh, uh, any white. I mean, you can find some, but uh, nothing compared to the quality of its uh, red wines. The main grapes used in the denominations of Valpolicella are Corvina, Corvinone, Rondinella, and Molinara. Corvina serves as the dominant base for most higher quality wines. Typically, Valpolicella's wine is dry, fruity, and juicy. It brims with red fruits and a trademark sour cherry note. What's the secret of the Valpolicella wines? 
They cannot be compared to any other wines of Italy. There is a reason, and it is the technique to make these wines, which is completely different from, for instance, the technique to make uh, Brunello in Tuscany or the technique to make uh, another great red Italian wine, uh, Italian wine, which is the Barolo. I will tell you why. The best vineyard sites fall around the classical zone, classical, classic zone of Valpolicella, of course. The traditional growing areas near to the villages of Fumane, Marano, and Negrar. The warmer, well-drained slopes, often comprised of calcareous volcanic and clay-rich soils, deliver Corvina of fuller body and flavor than fruit from the plains. So again, the best wine comes from the hills, not from the plains. Oh, this is a, a discovery, maybe you've heard about it. Uh, it took place one year ago in February, 2020, of course, uh, there were a lot of uh, articles in all the newspapers, magazines, the gala, but uh, for the pandemic, this uh, new went a uh, little bit undergone. And the winemaking tradition in this area, near Verona, it's so ancient like in Friuli, it dates back to the Roman times. That's why working in the vineyards, you can make incredible discoveries. In fact, as you can see, just uh, one meter underground, uh, the mosaic floor of a beautiful Roman villa was found, an amazing mosaic floor. I mean, not just one, a kind of carpet, big, huge carpet, that means that the construction of the building was truly big. Archaeologists were astonished to find, by the find of the remains of a villa believed to date the third century AD. They were unearthed in a hilly area above the town of Negrar di Valpolicella after the discovery in 1922, because the first time Villa was discovered in 1922, the site was mostly left abandoned until a team from the Superintendence of Archaeology, Fine Arts and Landscape of Verona resumed digging last summer. The team returned last summer means uh, not, uh, means uh, 2019. Sometimes uh, I don't consider, I've completely canceled 2020. The team returned to the site in October uh, and again in February. So October means 20, 2019, sorry. And again in February, which means instead uh, 2020, before the excavation was suspended because of the coronavirus pandemic. The mosaic was found a few meters beneath a row of wines a week after work uh, got going again. These are some uh, sections of the mosaic. There is also a beautiful mosaic with gladiators fighting in the arena. So what's the secret of the red wines of Valpolicella? The secret is the technique. This area, more than any other Italian uh, area of production of uh, red wines, produce wines of style. That means that the winemaker plays as much a role in the wine as terroir and food character. The four key styles from least to the most intensity are Valpolicella, then Valpolicella Ripasso, Amarone della Valpolicella, Recioto della Valpolicella. All are predominantly made with the same grapes. Vina, Corvinone, Rondinella, and Molinara. So what's the difference between them? It is the winemaking technique. 
that distinguishes them. So now I'm going to explain what makes them so special. But we will talk about uh, just Valpolicella di Passo, which is a bit, a little bit uh, uh, lower for the quality, and then Amarone, which is higher quality, top quality. This is the secret. The secret is uh, uh, to use partly dried grapes. Grapes are dried on mats before becoming Amarone della Valpolicella, or they are hung from rafters for weeks or months after harvest. This explains why the Amarone, for instance, is so expensive. You don't find so much liquid, so much juice into these grapes. So the quantity that you can extract from the dried grapes are much less. This process is called appassimento. And it was intentionally made to concentrate the flavors and the sugars. So then the grapes, when they are quite dried, are fermented to dryness, which results in a big, rich wine with robust alcohol levels that can be near 17% of alcohol by volume. So strong wines, but very elegant. Amarone, you can see the color, it's an uh, intense ruby red. Amarone della Valpolicella DOCG. DOCG is the top quality, became an international phenomenon in the 1990s. The name Amarone means big bitter. Yet despite this moniker, consumer reaction to this bold wine has made it a global success. At its best, Amarone shows uh, a strong concentration and uh, structure balanced by plushness and elegance. Flavors are dark berries, cocoa, and raisin. And again, they are a result of the winemaking style. Are foods you can uh, pair with Amarone. Of course, you cannot just uh, fry two eggs uh, and have them with the Amarone or with uh, pasta and tomato. It's completely wrong because um, when a, a, a wine is so elaborate, you know, need to be, it needs to be paired with uh, a food which is equally elaborate. So here you can see uh, tortelli with uh, ragu sauce and probably the filling is also meats and cheese, then dark chocolate, and then uh, the filet or uh, the beef steak, the Fiorentina or other types. Then we have uh, his uh, little brother. Aram Amarone little brother is called uh, Ripasso. Ripasso refers to the method of production, but it is also the name of the wine, the little brother of Amarone, honest little brother. It comes from uh, the word ripass. A category of wine awarded the OSC status in 2010. First, winemakers ferment a basic Valpolicella, a kind of basic wine made with the four types uh, Corvina, Molinara, Corvinone, and Rondinella, with these grapes. Next, they start the second fermentation using the pumice of grape skins left over from Amarone and Rechotta. 
So instead of throwing away the great skins, they reuse it with a regular kind of entry level wine to give it more taste, flavor, and to, we can say, reinforce its structure. And the Ripasso, it's another very good wine, it's incredibly good, a kind of very good comparison of quality price, which I, I love, I truly love. And the Ripasso is very well combined and also with a less, um, uh, elaborated food like uh, ham, uh, salami, or um, sausages, and uh, um, a simple pasta with uh, ragu sauce. And it is also not too bad with um, some snacks as uh, an aperitif for an aperitif. Then now I know that uh, everybody is excited because uh, we all love Prosecco. And when uh, we went to the sommelier school with my husband, uh, our teacher said, uh, Prosecco, it's easy to remember the recipe. Of it's the success of simplicity. And it's true. Prosecco is a very, very simple, wine, very easy, and uh, it's the success of easiness. So this is the region of Prosecco, which is uh, uh, near the city of Treviso. Let's say it's all around the city of Treviso. You can see a completely different landscape here. Try to imagine steep Italian hillsides carpeted with dense vineyards known for manual harvest. I think that there are too many wrong ideas about Prosecco because in the last 30, 40 years, the commercial success of this wine was so incredible that the market had been invaded by also imitations, fakes. But the true Prosecco, if you try the good one, you will never come back. And the good one comes from those hills where they cannot do mass production simply because there are very small um, vineyards and still these vineyards are owned by families that don't, cannot do big production. Sorry, Audrey. Mm -hmm. What? Did you ask some question? No, no. I haven't asked any uh, questions. <laughs> no, no, because I heard you talking. So I thought oh, uh, uh, you were about asking me a question. No, keep so, going, uh, you're doing great. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't I say, no, no, no problem. I didn't say uh, the reason why in Tuscany, um, in Veneto, hills are cultivated to make wine with hill, with uh, terraces. This since the Roman times and the Tuscan sun. This is a way to avoid the erosion. It's very clever. Uh, to avoid the, the, the loss of ground with uh, heavy rain, with the snow, there is a problem of erosion. And uh, it is uh, completely annulated if you work the hills on terraces like that because the vines then, they have the good ground to grow and to be healthy, to produce the best grapes. So it makes a lot of sense. Of course, uh, there is a, a lot of work behind. 
work for thousands of years to transform the landscape. And this is the reason why in 2019, the region Valdo Biadene, the picture here refers to the region of Valdo Biadene, has been declared UNESCO, UNESCO uh, Patrimonio dell'Umanità, not, but not for the same reason of the villas of Palladio we are talking about before. This is a special award, we can say, because uh, this is a landscape transformed with uh, cleverness, with respect, with intelligence by the man. And uh, these are the landscape considered um, Patrimonio Mondiale, so UNESCO heritage uh, for the entire humanity. And uh, a long history of winemaking here, because uh, there are old vines and some special microclimate. Uh, Corneliano Valdobbiade de Prosecco Superiore is the denomination. So if you want to buy the best Prosecco, you should have a look to the label and find where it is produced. The best is Conegliano Valdobbiadene Prosecco Superiore. But then I will tell you more things about uh, how to pick up a good bottle. A denomination where a number of producers made silky work class spark. A Prosecco has become almost synonymous with cheap, careful bubbly, but be a bit forgiven if you did realize that they are not all the same. Actually, because it had been in the last decades a uh, kind of big, big uh, uh, mass product, it's important to know about uh, the quality level. Um, the Prosecco DOC is at the bottom of this uh, triangle. The worst, I mean, uh, the less uh, expensive also, is largely made from low lying plains in an enormous blowing zone that spans two regions and nine provinces. Instead, Conegliano Valdobbiade de Prosecco Superiore DOCG hails from hillside vineyards across 15 communes in the Treviso province in Veneto. So you can see quantity and quality usually don't go together. Uh, in April 2019, it became the largest denomination in Europe to ban herbicide glyphosate glyphosate, glyphosate, I don't, I don't know the word in English. A few months later, the stunning hills of Conegliano Valdobbiadene were proclaimed UNESCO World Heritage Site, just in the ninth of the World Registered Cultural Landscape category. So ecco, I didn't remember the denomination, Cultural Landscape Category. Not all Prosecco is made equal. From Prosecco blends to outright counterfeits, the market is flooded with Prosecco imitators. So how do you spot the real thing? As well as a seal, an authentic bottle of Prosecco should have a label including the words Prosecco DOC and product of Italy. Of course, top bottling, they have this creamy, elegant taste, but two important things uh, to look at are the label made in Italy, Prosecco, and the denomination, DOC and DOCG. They are essentially quality stamps of approval, meaning Wines grown in this area must adhere to rules, including 
grapes used, methods of production, and how long the wine is aged. At the end, what Prosecco to pick up? In order to be called Prosecco, the feeds has to be produced in the Veneto region of Italy around the city of Treviso. Prosecco made in the DOC area are not subject to as many loads as one made in the OCG, meaning that the quality is always guaranteed. The G at the end, the OC and the OCG, means that in the OCG, the, the quality is always guaranteed. Both are great, but if you want la creme de la creme, I suggest you to trade up to a DOCG. The difference in terms of price is not so big. That's the difference in terms of quality is really big. Uh -huh. The native grape glera, this is the glera, is the main variety of the appellation. In Tuscany, we don't have any single bunch of glera because it's not in our tradition. And still, uh, uh, winemaking in Italy is uh, based on the traditional, and the traditional ways, the traditional grapes, the traditional vines. It must account for at least 85% of the final wine, although many producers use it ex exclusively. Known as the Martinotti or Charmat method, so Prosecco is not made the method used to make champagne. Champagne is made with the second fermentation in the bottle. And uh, it's called Metodo Classico, while Prosecco is made with another method invented by Martinotti. Of course, the French people say, no, we invented it. So they say that a man called Charmat invented this method. And uh, to be equal, it's nice to say Martinotti or Charmat method. Second fermentation in this production process starts after sugar and yeast are added. All proseccos, proseccos undergo this process in large pressurized tanks called autoclaves. Autoclaves, I don't know the word in English. The technique highlights glera's perfume, freshness, and balance between acidity and sugar. So it's a perfect technique to keep uh, the perfumes, the freshness. Actually, when you, you taste a good Prosecco uh, in your mouth, you can taste uh, the, the grape because it's not so manipulated. And then we pass to the wines of uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia, which is a, a region uh, to discover, not only for the wines, but also for the rich cultural heritage and the beautiful uh, countryside and landscapes. Um, Friuli Venezia Giulia lies in the extreme northern eastern Italy with Slovenia bordering it on the east and Austria on the north, to the north. Its capital and largest city is Trieste. In the wine world, Friuli Venezia Giulia is best known for white wines made from such white varieties as Pinot Grigio and Friulano. It has four DOCGs and 12 DOCs. In 2017, Venezia Giulia, sorry, oh my God. In 2017, uh, Venezia Giulia produced over 1.6 million of hectoliters of wine. And the 77% of it was white. One of the highest proportions of white 
wine production of Italy. And this is uh, the landscape of uh, the hills of Friuli with uh, vineyards. Uh, it's very nice to travel in Friuli Venezia Giulia because it's uh, Italy of the beaten path. Of course, uh, all the travelers from all over the world, uh, they want to come in Italy and their itineraries are already set and they should include the visits to Rome, Florence and Venice. You can sometimes also go uh, to of the beaten path places, which are, I think, not uh, so off the beaten path anymore. Destinations like the San Gimignano, Bologna, the Cinque Terre, Cortona, but there are many fascinating towns and cities in uh, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, which are less known and so incredible because history here was truly incredible. And these towns are Aquileia, Cividale, and also the cities like Trieste, Udine, Gorizia, and the countryside is uh, gorgeous. So let's talk about Aquileia. Aquileia is uh, famous for its Roman ruins. It was a place of great importance in the Roman times, a commercial center, a religious center, and things to see and things to do in Friuli are, for instance, walking in the steps of the Romans in Aquileia. Incredible remains of uh, Roman buildings, Roman temples with mosaics, floor, a uh, beautiful museum in Aquileia and such an interesting history. Then uh, Cividale, sorry, uh, see sì, Cividale del Friuli. Uh, you can see here the bridge and uh, Cividale also was uh, an important place, uh, um, very rich town and uh, there are uh, historical monuments, uh, uh, churches with frescoes of the early Christian periods and uh, influences from Austria and from uh, the Balkanic area of Europe in the architecture, in the um, paintings and uh, Trieste. Trieste is a very charming. There is an incredible atmosphere. And this city is uh, the capital of uh, the Friuli Venezia Giulia, the most important uh, city. Uh, there is a long tradition of uh, um, um, Inter internationality, it's very international because in the past uh, it was more connected to Austria, the Austrian Empire. It was part of the Austrian Empire, like uh, Venice, like uh, the other cities of Friuli. And uh, still it preserves this uh, air with this um, sense of uh, being part of uh, Northern Europe rather than Italy. And this is the castle of Miramare, beautiful castle near Trieste. Then we have uh, the city of uh, Udine, the city of Gorizia, and if uh, we can uh, find about Friuli, we can say that uh, it's uh, the heaven of white wines in Italy. Some of the best white wines uh, come from Friuli. Uh, the region is not so big, 
the region is relatively small compared to the rest of Italy. But as I said, it ranks among the best for producers of white wines. Of course, if you are a red wine lover, you can go to other regions, Piedmont, Tuscany, or even to the south, like uh, Puglia. But if you really love the white wines, the best white wines of Italy can be found in northern eastern Italy. Actually, so no, now, sorry, Susanna, did anybody on our program today purchase any of the white wines from that area? No? Ah, oh, you did, Kathy. Which one did you get? The Ribola Gialla? I got, oh, doggone it. How do you pronounce this? Masud, Ribola, Ribola Gialla? It's Masud da Ravi from... Oh, I... oh, yes, okay. Yeah, Masud da, I can't see the third word. Adarive, okay, Masud Adarive, nice. Very good. I, I, I don't know because I have my screen now, but then I... I can, um, if I can see the label. Yeah, she can tell you. Yes. We will be discussing two of the top white wine regions of Friuli. One is Collio. You can see another different system of uh, growing and cultivating the vines. What's from Collio? The Collio region is on the very border to Slovenia in the Gorizia district, where the slopes become steeper and steeper. And the cool Bora wind brings freshness and higher acidity into the grapes of Collio. Acidity means longevity. So like for uh, a person, a woman or a man, they are women which uh, get old better <laughs> and women, it's like the wine. <laughs> I usually make this comparison. And uh, which are women or men which uh, get older in a worse way. In this case, for the wines, I don't think for us, because uh, it could be a good thing to be acid and uh, get less old. Uh, acidity keeps the wine younger. This area accounts for little more than 5% of the vineyards, but traditionally account for the highest quality and awards. The international varieties find far, far, favorable conditions to express their potential. Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Grigio, which is Pinot Gris, and more are more thicker and more powerful. There are indigenous grapes as well. And they are Malvasia, but above all, Ribolla Gialla and Friulano, formerly known as Tokai, and then also the sweet grape, uh, indigenous grapes. Can you see this picture? This is the Ribolla Gialla. As you can see, the berries are really big. Of course, this is not a uh, real scale. It's a big, big, uh, uh, picture, but actually the berries are bigger rather than the normal size of uh, uh, berries. And then the color is a beautiful, um, very intense yellow. It's a kind of uh, uh, some yellow. The Ribolla Gialla is a yellow grape, as the name itself indicates. Gialla, gialla means yellow. And an ancient variety of Friuli, Venezia Giulia, 
cultivated since the Roman times. The Ribolla gialla grape has never spread to the plains, preferring dry and hilly terrain where it gives rise to intense and structured wines with its yellow berries. I love Ribolla gialla. I wrote it because I really, I'm, for me, it's a fantastic uh, grape, less uh, estimate, underestimate. I agree. And it's also very nice. Grape to produce, see, intense yellow wines with weak greenish tones, with the delicate nose, with fruity scents, slightly floral and herbaceous. The wine has good acidity, medium body, and a delicate and pleasant texture. Why I love it? I love it because it's uh, for its versatility. Here you can see all the um, flavors that you can find. Apple, tangerine, citrus, uh, and also thyme. These these works I, I don't agree, but you know. So sometimes, so, so something I really like about the ribola is uh, its versatility. So far, I have been able to enjoy great samples of dried wines, both fresh and aged, macerated wines and sparkling wines, elaborated with the ribola. And I know somebody producing also a sweet wine with it. So you can have many different types of wines, all made with the same grape, with the ribolla, from the dried wines, the dry wines to the macerated wines and sparkling wines, and also sweet wines, dessert wine. So as you can see, quite an array of styles employing this wonderful variety. Just one grape, different wines. You can see in these glasses, different colors, but they are made, the wines are made with the same grape, the ribolla gialla. The difference is the process. To make this orange wine, you need to keep the skins more time with uh, the, the juice of the berry. An important feature of this grape is that its thick skin, which makes it perfect for using skin maceration for long periods. Depending on air, some winemakers macerate the mass on the skins for short periods, such as eight to 10 days, while others go farther down this road for months. Ribolla gialla, Dry wines are really easy to drink with a nice balance of fruit and acidity, making them highly enjoyable. Sparkling Ribolla, it's a wine that you can drink all the way from the aperitif uh, until the end. And the orange wine are completely different and they are obtained with uh, maceration. Then the second region, it's Colli Orientali de Friuti, the eastern hills of Friuli, eastern mon, easternmost hills uh, from Friuli, of Friuli. Colli Orientali de Friuli, white wines. They say the best wine, the best wine comes from the hills, and it is true. Colli Orientali de Friuli, East of Udini is where winemaking dates back to Roman times, as it is in Verona, as it is uh, in the Colli area. Vines do very well when they are planted on the Colli, on the hills, which are protected by the Alps to the north and exposed to gentle sea breezes to the south. Again, the microclimate is uh, very important, extremely important. Also in this area, Corli Orientale del Friuli, there are international as well as indigenous grapes. But for us, for me, uh, indigenous grapes are more interesting because you can find international 
uh, vines, international grapes everywhere. But uh, Ribolla Gialla and Friulano are typically from the air since thousands of years. Today, you can find international and local varieties growing side by side, including Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, and Pinot Gris. White wines of color in Tali del Friuli feature scents of white flowers and ripe apples. This is its character. And it is uh, pretty common uh, for all the grapes grown here. On the palate, you will taste a lot of stone fruit and a long tangly finish. Despite the prevalence of the international varieties in Col Orientali, is the local varieties that are worthy of interest. The second interesting uh, indigenous grape is uh, the Friulano, which was the former Tokai. Still now it is called uh, Tokai, Friulano Tokai. And I will tell you the story at the end. The Friulano. Actually, it is from the family of Sauvignon Vert. Uh, the most important local variety include Friulano, which is the region's signature grape. Friulano, the name comes from Friuli. So it's a kind of son of Friuli, Friuli song. Friulano wines are lean and crunchy with delicate notes of thyme, apricot, green pear, lemon, and white peach with a bitter almond finish. Uh, this is a nice picture of uh, Friulano. There was a battle between uh, Italy and Hungary for the name of this grape. Because uh, before the name was uh, Tokai, in Italy, everybody made this wine and put on the label instead of Friulano, its original name, its historical name, which was Tokai. So there was then, in 1993, a battle for the bottles. Who is the winner? Just have a taste. So this is an article from 1993. Hungary filed a complaint with the EU, EU petitioning that uh, Italy was labeling wines as Tokai. The Hungarians' complaint was based on a common precept of trademark law. The Hungarians were the first to use the name Tokai in commerce. A protracted legal battle ended only in 2005 with the AU decision that the Italians could use the designation Tokai only on bottles sold in Italy. So now the wine is bottled with the name Friulano Tokai, but we cannot use the word Tokai. Actually, there was a misunderstanding because for the Hungarians, Tokai is the name of the wine, yeah. but for uh, Friuli, it's the name of the grape. Okay, exact is the name of the grape. But actually, there were, um, I mean, uh, they were considered the first uh, of uh, of having used this name, and so. They were, the, the UAU say that they were right and uh, we could not use uh, the designation Tokai anymore for the uh, white wine produced in Friuli with this grape. So keep calm, keep calm and relax and let's have a toast. Uh, this is uh, the end because of course, uh, nobody wants to fight. I think that uh, the best wine is decided by the people by the palate and uh, uh, Hungary is of course much less known for its wine than Italy. So 
I am very generous and I say, okay, we don't mind, we have good wines and at the end, we have won our battle. <laughs> okay, I have finished with my slides. If you have some, um, some question, yeah, if you, and, uh, uh, if you want to stop, you have some curiosity, and then that yes. way we can have the full view here. So thank you, Sophia, uh, wonderful uh, presentation again. Um, thank you, thank you, Audrey. And, <laughs> I tried to see you because uh, uh, I don't know what's happened. I see just uh, oh, I can. Uh, if you can, I can stop, stop uh, yeah. see. Just so a well, moment. Most okay. Perfect. There we go. So, does anybody have any questions for Susanna regarding what you saw today or heard today? You can unmute Hi. yourself. I just typed in, can Susanna compare, she knows I like the Orvieto white I had last time in Tuscany, to the Friulano. Is it, is it bolder in Friulano? Totally different. I taste it's it's totally apple. different. It's totally different because the grape is different. The air is different. It's like to compare an apple with a banana. <laughs> what I said about so. the apple, is the the apple taste, and that's how you describe the Friulano. I like the apple, the crispness. Janet, you have yes. to come. I'll take you. Taste it. <laughs> You should, you should. No, it's true. It's uh, not comparable because uh, everything is different. The, the type uh, of grape is different. The area is different. The ground is different. The, uh, so it's, um, the only thing that they have in common <laughs> is that they are white. <laughs> Okay, I just decided there are 20 regions in Italy I need to do a month in each one. Exactly. Minimum. That's it. Uh, you, you know what, Janet? Uh, no, no. It's not, a, it's not a silly question. It works for the international grapes. Yeah. International grapes that you can find everywhere, you can do this question. Yes. Like Sauvignon from uh, Collio. What is the difference between Sauvignon of Collio and Sauvignon, for instance, made in Tuscany? Because uh, there is something in common. It's the same, uh, the same uh, child grown in different places, right. okay? Different family. And it's very interesting. Yeah. Because then the difference depends on the soil, on the climate, but uh, the DNA is the same. Mm -hmm. But the comparison between uh, two um, two grapes, which are totally different, uh, it's uh, it's not possible. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I cannot oh, answer okay. your question. <laughs> Any other questions for Susanna? No, I wanted to bring. Uh, you should point. come. I know. I wanted to bring. And we should go to the. And we will have time to discuss yeah. in front of a glass of wine. I know. I, I wanted to I discuss a green apple. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no more. It's no not more. yellow. It's not green. <laughs> so I wanted to have a silly conversation on. sometimes to relax. Yeah, husband. <laughs> so I just wanted to bring up a, a point that Susanna brought up a couple of times during her presentation, and that is the, um, the off the beaten path concept. Um, Kathy, who's with yes, us today, exactly. um, has, uh, is a, a wonderful client, uh, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I love who she is as a person, and um, she has traveled with us several times, and um, I, I think Kathy can attest to that. Um, I prefer to take my clients off the beaten path. That is the premise of why we actually created Travels with Audrey so many years ago, 
to help you, the person who's coming to Italy, to discover the real Italy. Yes, there is the classic and everybody needs to see it. The beautiful city of Venice, one of my favorite cities in the world. Florence with all the art and the history. Rome, again, with all its history. But there is so much more. Italy requires more than one visit, especially if you love the country and you want to discover more. So if you're a first time traveler, I say, yes, definitely. You need to go see the main sites. But if you're planning on coming back, that is the, the, the direction that we're taking. And we're basically offering, we've put together some packages. My, my friend Michelle, who's on tonight with us, has been of great help with this as well. We are putting together um, one week packages that concentrate on one specific region. You stay in one place. So when Susanna was talking about the Colio, those rolling hills, vine covered hills, we have you staying in a beautiful agriturismo and we take you on day trips visiting places like Chividale, Aquileia. There's so much to see uh, within a one week time period. So. Mm -hmm. This is something that we're developing because it's something that we specialize in. And so if you guys are thinking of doing something like this, and for those of you who've traveled with me before who did the classical, I always, always try to incorporate in your itinerary something that not everybody else gets to see. Um, because there is that option. A lot of people stay to that one strict itinerary. Oh, you can't deviate. But because it's customized for you, um, we can take you and say, you know what? You're traveling from here to here. I would love to show you this place that not everybody has a chance to get to see, which is something we did with Mickey and, and her group with Kathy. Um, now, Susanna will be back with us on March 5th. Um, she will be covering the wines of Piemonte. Uh, those of you mm -hmm. who received my yeah. newsletter, you have the link for that one already. Uh, we have just recently created um, a website page on my website, uh, which I'm proud of, but I haven't finished it yet, so I can't, <laughs> I can't send you the link to it yet. But it will have all our uh, virtual tours on it, as well as upcoming virtual tours, so that you can just go to this one page on our website, and everything will be there for you and all the information you're looking for. Uh, I also, if you have time, I want to show you, I asked Kathy if she was okay with it, show you the video that uh, her, uh, of her private tour with us, because it covered a lot of these places that Susanna was talking about. So if you guys don't mind, uh, I'd like to share this with you. So let me share my screen here. And let me open this up here. Oopsie.
Wonderful walk down memory lane. Oops, Thank I, I removed my own sound. Hold on. It makes me feel uh, like uh, I would like to to come to travel with you. <laughs> yeah. to oh God! I lost my own sound. <laughs> you are convincing me too. <laughs> I'm back. <Right. laughs> Very well done. Well, thank you, Kathy, for letting us share that with everyone. <laughs> Thank you. It was delightful to see it again, to walk back down memory lane. Mickey was on the front side of the family trip. Um, was. Classic Italy. And then she flew home with the rest of the family. And I stayed on with Audrey and we did some more, some more adventures. So it was awesome. So wow. it was truly the best trip of my life, Audrey. It was wonderful. It was wow. so, so wonderful. Thanks, Mickey. I have a beautiful video of your trip too. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's it. I think you guys are awesome. And uh, for those of Thanks. you that signed up for tomorrow, we have Marco, who is my guide in Torino. So tomorrow he's going to walk us through the city of Torino, which is in the region of Piemonte. So for those of you who signed up for that tomorrow, we will see you tomorrow. That is uh, 9 a.m. Pacific. So that would be uh, uh, 12 o'clock. 10, 11, 12, yeah, 12 o'clock uh, Eastern uh, time. Thanks very much, Susanna. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you all uh, March, uh, the March 5. Yes, okay. March 5. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.